Hello and welcome to Unfit for Purpose. I'm Penny Spikins. I'm a lecturer in the Archaeology of Human Origins here at York. Today's event is part of the York Festival of Ideas Online. Although in a different format, the festival continues to aim to enhance York's reputation as a city of ideas and innovation through offering the highest caliber of public events. The 2020 festival has over 60 online events offering an inspiring program for all ages. The University of York is proud to lead on the development of the York Festival of Ideas. Thank you for joining us today and we hope you enjoy the adventure we're about to take you on. A few technical notes. If you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on your screen. That's at the center at the bottom. This is available throughout the talk, so questions can be asked at any time. Should you have technical issues, such as the loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch again. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Adam Hart. Adam is a professor at the University of Gloucestershire, where he carries out research on entomology, ecology and citizen science, and is a regular broadcaster and author of popular science articles. He's presented documentaries for BBC Radio 4, BBC 4 and BBC 2, as well as the weekly BBC radio programme Science in Action. The, he's the author of The Life of Poo, about our complex relationship with bacteria. However, today we're going to find out a bit more about his latest book. I've been delighted to have been reading it recently, and I think it's absolutely exciting, and I'm sure we'll find out some really interesting things. Adam today is going to tell us about the many ways in which biological adaptations that evolved to help us to survive and thrive now work against us. So over to you, Adam. That's great. Thank you, Penny. And thank you to your Festival Ideas for keeping this going. Um, let me just share my screen here so that we can see what we're doing. Unfit for Purpose really is um, a sometimes quite playful thesis about the fact that human evolution really provides some echoes and, and sometimes more than just echoes um, that we can really see in the modern world because the modern world is a very different place from the world in which um, we evolved. And I guess the fact that I'm talking to you um, from my, my, my barricaded bedroom here over Zoom sort of illustrates that point where, where at the moment about a third of the world's population is sheltering uh, behind closed doors um, because of COVID-19. And back in December was when COVID-19 was first identified. And, and so within just a handful of months, that virus has gone around the world and caused a huge amount of, of that's, the, that's the cliche for this year goes, unprecedented problems for humanity. And one of the reasons for that, or two of the reasons for that really, um, can be clearly seen in our, in our evolution. We have evolved to be highly social. Um, lots of our adaptations of language, for example, and, and lots of adaptations within our brain and our thought process facilitate that social behavior and, and sociality of course would have been a great defense for us um, back in the early times of, of our ancestors history um, particularly for defense against predators and so on but but now that um, that has become a great cost to us that sociality is what allows us to transmit this virus quite so effectively um, the other point of course is that our brain has evolved to be arguably the most complex structure in the universe and it's capable of incredible innovation and novelty including of course flying around the world and that is the perfect transfer mechanism for any diseases that we carry with us so actually we can see two points of human evolution or two features of human evolution that are very relevant to our situation right now um, regardless of the evolution of our immune system so it's it's sort of appropriate i guess that i'm, I'm perhaps talking to you um over zoom um for this it sort of illustrates the point that the modern world and our evolutionary history occasionally produce mismatches and those mismatches can be sometimes of, of, of general interest sometimes they can be incredibly damaging so that's the sort of thing that, that i'm going to be talking about but it's only right really to start by pointing out the fact that we're going to be looking at some of our frailties and I'm going to be looking at some of the problems that we have. But of course, as a species, we are incredible and we should, I think, embrace that. We have achieved 
unbelievable things as a consequence of the evolution of our, of our complex brains. We can explore space. We've got the space station up here, which you can see. You can go outside at night and you can see this passing overhead. It's an unbelievable thing that we can do that. We can consider the idea of exploring the solar system. We can also, of course, at the same time, that is looking at the universe in a very large scale. We can also look at the universe in a very tiny scale, the quantum scale. We can look at, at subatomic particles. We can smash uh, uh, atoms together and find out the very the very fabric of, of the universe itself. Um, we hold in our hands now computing power, which um, dwarfs almost anything that was found 20, 25 years ago. And, and we use it mostly for liking pictures of cats and sharing sharing sort of humorous videos. It's, it's almost an insult, really, what, what we what we do with that technology. But it's absolutely remarkable where we are. Um, medical technology at the moment is is, is staggering. Um, we've got someone here un undergoing brain surgery where they're actually playing a violin at the same time. And specific electrodes and, and various other instruments are being used to dissect out a tumor from this person's awake, more or less conscious brain. You know, that is a remarkable thing. Medical science, of course, is, is, is really showing its, its form now as well with the COVID-19 crisis. And we're realistically talking about having vaccines in, in place by the end of this year or the beginning of next year. You know, that, that type of development is, is awe-inspiring. And we have to realize that we are an awe-inspiring creature. We may have our frailties, but we are awesome. And, and away from science, of course, we've got the other great marks of, of human civilization and human intelligence. We've got art and, and and literature and those types of endeavors. So within all of that, what we see is a species that has really thrived on planet Earth and we've achieved global dominance. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, but in creating this modern world uh, and this world which can be very um, very much characterized by lots of, of different features of modernity. You know, we have um, lots of people living together in high density environments, for example, literally living on top of each other. We've got very technological heavy world. We have social interactions on all kinds of different levels. We've created, of course, a virtual world now as well, which enhances and in some cases doesn't enhance our, our real world. So we have ruthlessly changed our environment. And this isn't something that's new. Um, we'll see later the evolution of agriculture was really probably the biggest change in environment that we've had. Um, and we have this, this new environment that we've created. And most of us, most of the, the members of, of humanity live in, in this new world and live a lifestyle that is very, very different from the lifestyle, certainly of a few centuries ago and a few millennia ago, certainly. But actually, when you think about it, some of the changes that we've experienced are different from even a decade ago. Uh, we can have conversations now about Zooming and things going viral. And we use phrases which have entered into the everyday language that, that in some cases, well, in the case of Zoom, perhaps even a few months ago, wouldn't have made any sense, but certainly wouldn't have made any sense a decade or two decades ago, or to look at it in evolutionary terms a generation ago. So we change our environment very, very rapidly. And despite being extraordinarily successful across the globe, um, we clearly don't always thrive in, in this modern world. And I've got a few examples of, of that lack of, of thriving, lack of thrivation. Um, here, of course, obesity, which is something we'll, we'll look at in a moment, uh, is a major health problem and, and actually a health problem that's implicated with some of the more serious complications of COVID-19. Um, obesity is a, is a very clear issue that is a modern world, a, a Western lifestyle, a modern lifestyle problem um, relating to um, our diet and our very recent change in dietary environment. Um, we now have calories are plenty. There is a potency and an availability in the modern world when it comes to food. And actually, as we'll see when it comes to lots of other things as well, things like information and so on, that simply wasn't there for our ancestors. It simply wasn't available. Um, linking into that, of course, we, we've also got other problems with, with the way that we interact with our food. Um, many people are, are lactose intolerant around the world. In actual fact, the ability to um, process lactose in milk and, and dairy products and to eat raw milk in that form is, is, is in fact a minority ability. And as we'll see, it's linked to our evolutionary history. It's an evolved strategy that evolved hand in hand with our development of dairying as, as, a, as a, a form of, of agriculture. But that wasn't the case across the world. But now we're seeing because of the globalization that we've managed to produce because of our brains an interconnectivity of, of markets and of diets and a homogenization of, of diets that's causing problems as people encounter these foods um, and we'll see that the, um, the cheese becomes particularly central in that. Um, over on the, the top right there, um, 
let, let's call it gluten intolerance. It's an umbrella term and it's not a term really that, that's particularly beloved by the medical profession. It's much more subtle than that. Um, and there are lots of different features within it. But nonetheless, um, these food intolerances and, and also, of course, leading to things like allergies, which we see much more of in the modern world. And we can link that to all kinds of aspects of our of our lifestyle, but also uh, aspects of our environment. So aspects of our bacterial fauna, for example, flora that live inside of our guts. Uh, move, moving around clockwise, um, I've got a, a few, um, that, that's not a photograph of my coffee table, although you know, it might make these things easier to deal with over the last few months, but, but we, we are, we are pre-programmed to, to, for, for, for addiction. Um, we love drugs, we love mind-altering experiences, um, we are absolute um, suckers for these things, whether it's alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, or what we would consider societally to be harder drugs we have a problem with substance abuse and that problem is manifested at society level and at individual level. But if we look back into our evolutionary past, in some cases quite a long way back, in some cases less, less far, we can see that, that we have a, a, an evolutionary echo within our brains that, that cause us to be um, hijacked by some of these substances. Um, violence. Violence is, a, is undoubtedly a scourge of modern society and we can see violence manifesting itself at all manner of levels, whether it's um, domestic violence, which, which is clearly a problem um, and a great concern during, during this lockdown phase, but also we can see violence manifested at, at the global level um, and even at the level of, of genocide. So I'm going to explore some of the ideas that perhaps we're inherently violent and people talk about our evolutionary tendencies towards violence. Well, yes, that is probably true, but also we have evolutionary tendencies towards not being violent too. And we've had the evolution of, of mechanisms that prevent us from, from getting stuck in all the time. Um, so we can discuss some of that. Uh, moving across to, to something that I think is a very much a problem of the very modern world. This is, this is an issue really of the last five or 10 years. We've created a virtual world which causes for some people, and at times I would say almost for everyone, a tremendous amount of problems. Social media is an extraordinarily demanding part of many people's lives, and it can become a very damaging part of people's lives, which is counterintuitive really, because we, we know that friendships are extremely important. Um, we know in the real world that friendship networks are extremely important. So what is it about our evolutionary history that makes these online friendships or friendships, perhaps we should call them, uh, potentially damaging for some people? And, and we can talk about some of the evolutionary mechanisms and our, our sort of heuristics and, and thinking processes that have evolved there, which might be... Um, uh, conspiring uh, with this modern environment that we've created to produce something that's actually in, in many cases can be quite harmful. And then uh, moving across here to, um, uh, uh, that's not, that's not um, uh, uh, me as a caricature, although before I had my hair cut it could just about be that. Um, most of us are feeling stress at the moment. We, we use the word stress quite, quite loosely in modern society, but it's, but it's very clear that this, this environment that we've created, not just recently, but, but the, the modern world environment, the modern lifestyle, creates an enormous opportunity for stress. And yet at the same time, stress is an involved lifesaver. It's an absolute lifesaver. And, and that fight or flight response is something that we should all be grateful of at some point and have all been grateful of, I'm sure, at some point in our lives. So how, how does that now conspire against the modern world? So we see these modern world problems and we can treat each of them individually and, and, and we will. But actually, there's a sort of overarching theme here, which is what, what they are, are problems that are manifested in, in this modern world that we've created. And, and actually, what we see is echoes of our evolutionary past conspiring against us. So that's that's the sort of overall idea. And this links to the idea that perhaps in this modern world that we've created, we are unfit for purpose. And, and, and the way to think about that is that, and this is very easy to forget, of course, we, we are animals. Um, I think one of the things that the COVID-19 crisis has really underlined is the fact that we are animals. Um, you know, a, a, a virus has jumped from one species into us. It's found the perfect host. Let's be honest, it must have been rubbing its sort of uh, spike proteins together in glee when it made it into us. Um, you know, it's really it's really highlighted the fact that we are animals. And and just like every other organism on the planet, animal, plant, fungus, or or protist or bacteria alike, um, we have been subject to natural selection into evolution. And that evolution produces, of course, um, adaptations to the environment that we're in. That's the nature of, of natural selection. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, when, those, when that environment changes, which we see, of course, in, in the natural world very frequently, when that environment changes, the adaptations that you've evolved no longer fit quite as well with the new environment. Of course, that then generally stimulates a new selection environment. 
Um, that's what we've seen across human history. We'll see that it happened to us when we when we developed agriculture, a major change in our environment that we were in many cases able to um, come up with evolutionary um, uh, adaptations to to fix. And in fact, uh, the way that that the very modern human looks is is in some respects a response to to agriculture. But of course. When we change our environment as massively as we have tended to do over the last generation or two, um, not only are we changing it massively, we're changing it rapidly, that can result in mismatches. And it's really those mismatches that are at the, the heart of, of, of the book and, and this thesis. So let's just have a quick primer in evolution. Um, I'm sure I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here um, because generally speaking, people come to um, festivals and, and science festivals knowing this sort of stuff. But I think it's always worth kind of recapping some of this because um, it can be quite a good question to throw in at students, I found. You, you say, right, what is evolution? And actually you'll see people sort of, uh, because we have this kind of idea what it is, but it's quite hard sometimes to come up with a pithy explanation for it. But, but a, a pithy definition of evolution is very simply, it's a change in gene frequency over time. Um, that's all it is really. Um, some genes will get more common, some genes will get less common. These are examples of evolution and and that's that's all it is of course what we're mainly concerned with when we think about evolution is the evolution of adaptations and generally speaking we're thinking about the evolution of adaptations through the process of natural selection which was um a darwin's well one of darwin's great legacies and he came up with a whole load of them it's very it's very rare actually that you're doing a bit of work in biology where you don't find some echo of darwin um in there somewhere but I've got an example here of some snails here. This is would be, if you like, a classic piece of predation um, adaptation, much as we would find with the classic example of the peppered moth. Here we've got a population of snails. They're predominantly black shelled snails, um, but a, a snail with a gray shell appears every so often. It's at a very low frequency. It's, it's appearing as a mutation, might be a single gene mutation. Um, quite common to find those in, in these sorts of changes. Could be multiple genes that mutate, but either way, we've got this kind of snail with a gray shell and, and that starts to do quite well in this environment because it's not being selected by predators. Perhaps it's better camouflaged and, and we see that starting to thrive. And then actually um, within that gray shell, we, we find another mutation happening or we find a polygenic situation where individuals that are further over and slightly paler um, do better as a consequence of those genes interacting. And we start to get a slow gradual mutation um, replacement over generations from the black form of those snails which would be perhaps easily picked off by predators in this new environment into a paler and paler form and eventually we get um, these genes spreading to what's called fixation where the majority of the population uh, typically more than 95 percent is expressing those genes it's a very beautiful logical process it relies on certain features it, it relies on uh, the traits that you have having a genetic underpinning so if we're going to talk about evolution we're going to talk about changes in gene frequency. What we have to talk about is things that are genetically underpinned. And, and that's something that's, that, that can become increasingly difficult as we look at more complex human traits like violence, for example. And we'll, we'll talk about that because these are very complicated traits and, and disentangling the influence of environment of, of nurture from the influence of genetics of nature can be very, very difficult. But we are thinking about genes, which, uh, about traits which have a genetic um, underpinning in some way and those traits must um, have an effect on typically we think of survival because of the phrase survival of the fittest which of course wasn't Darwin's phrase but actually what we're interested in is um, reproduction the number of offspring that you leave in the next generation or more accurately the number of offspring which are capable of reproducing that you leave in the next generation there's no point in leaving a whole load of, of infertile offspring for example or a whole load of offspring that are so weak that they're unable to, to breed so it's really you're really looking at the sort of fitness of your grandchildren the number of grandchildren that you can produce and, and that's what happens. And it's a beautiful logic to it. It's an extremely straightforward thing. It's, it's almost remarkable that Darwin was the first person, along with Wallace, to sort of synthesize this together, actually. But once you get that sort of logical simplicity, evolution essentially becomes mathematics. And, and we can model this type of gene um, frequency change very um, straightforwardly, actually, often using mathematical approaches. So that's that's what we're dealing with. Where mostly concerned in in this session with natural selection and in fact most of the time when we're talking about evolution we are generally talking about evolution through natural selection but there are other mechanisms that evolution can proceed as well um the peacock up there on the left hand side is a good example this is um sexual selection and sexual selection is when we get the evolution of often quite exaggerated or elaborate traits like the peacock's tail for example or traits which are involved in in especially actually into male competition um so that um what you end up with is males typically 
competing for females. Females are the scarce resource in many species. Um, males are always available to mate, basically, because sperm is relatively cheap. And females, on the other hand, are investing in eggs and perhaps, um, in the case of mammals, become pregnant and removed from that breeding population or they're set on eggs. So you've always got this surplus of males wandering around looking for opportunities for females. And of course, that allows females to be choosy, right? This is economics, I guess, um, at its heart. And so what you end up with is males competing with each other um, through aggression, but also competing for the attentions of females. And you end up with these elaborate traits that allow females to make a selection of males that they consider to be either the most attractive or in some cases, those traits are related to underlying um, qualities of that male, how good the male is, um, particularly in things like its immune system and so on. And actually, we can see that in, um, in, in humans, although some of the evidence is quite, is quite tricky, um, but things like facial symmetry in humans can be linked to um, um, underlying traits in some cases. So that's sexual selection. Um, across on the right-hand side with those meerkats staring at us and, and honeybees there, we've got kin selection. Uh, kin selection occurs in highly related groups where individuals, um, where genes can prosper within individuals that don't necessarily have offspring themselves, but allow, allow or facilitate other members of their group to have offspring. The, the honeybee is the classic example, the example which vexed Darwin actually when he was putting these ideas forward. The queen is the reproductive and the workers are helping her. But we can see this type of kin selection at work in a huge number of different species um, that are far less um, social than honeybees, including things like meerkats. Uh, down on the bottom left, um, something that's very relevant to humans because it's usually done by us um, by definition is artificial selection. And we can see that really very, very clearly in the um, selection of, of crops, modern crops in, in agriculture. So we, we, we select traits that we like either deliberately um, or sometimes accidentally simply um, uh, by virtue of, for example, domesticating animals, those animals which which sort of don't kill us or run away, we can domesticate. So it becomes a slightly accidental process at times. Um, but we end up with with modern crops which look nothing like their antecedents. Um, so that's artificial selection. And then we have another form of, of evolution, which is often overlooked, but will become important as we talk about obesity. And that's the idea of genetic drift. And genetic drift is really um, to do with chance sampling. It's It's not directed in terms of selection. Um, a good example here, we've got a, a group of beetles, they're polymorphic for a colour, um, we've got some green and some brown, it just so happens that someone comes along and, and steps on a couple of the green ones and they're reduced in the population and, and slowly get selected out. Of course it might be that, that somebody's shoe fell on all of those brown beetles and for some reason, even though they were rarer at the time, by some chance event we end up with this sampling where green beetles become more common and then they're more common in the next generation and so on and we can end up with this idea of genetic drift it's evolution occurring because genes are changing in frequency but it's not evolution occurring through any form of sort of directed selection okay so let, let's move on to a few examples then and and this is actually the the, the sort of example that leads the the, the book as well. It's um it's a very um, clear example of how evolution can play a role, but actually it's not quite as clear as, as some of the sort of um, tabloid treatment of it can can um, lead us to believe. And that's the idea of obesity. And obesity here is being defined as um, BMI, which is your um, uh, weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. There are some issues with BMI, but it's it's a very good comparator. And you can see if we look across the world right now. Um, that these are the number of people that are defined as being overweight or obese. And obesity is defined here as having a BMI um, greater than 30. Um, so actually quite, quite large. Um, a BMI between 20 and 25 is considered to be healthy um, and normal. Oh, I had to do mine for the book. It was 23, so I was quite pleased with that. Um, but if we look across the um, if we look across the world, we can see that basically the darker the colour, the darker the blue, the the worse the the, the problem in terms of obesity. As we we see the US there um, and um, Saudi Arabia actually, they're quite high. Um, other Arab states over there are also quite high. What's missing, as we'll see in a moment, is what's called the South Pacific Island cluster, where we see a huge level of a very high level of obesity. Um, but thanks to the Eurocentric way of of this map, we don't see those states, um, but you can see across Europe and uh, across um, Russia and, and those states over there, we can see across across the world actually a pattern of obesity and it's rising. And it's also rising across age groups too. We're seeing a rise in childhood obesity, for example. Um, you know, let, let's let's cut let's cut a long story short, right? We're getting fatter. Okay, that that we, we can see that with the evidence of our own eyes. We can see it with with a vast majority of with a huge range of medical studies that have been done. We are becoming um, obese as a species, we are getting fatter. Um, and 
a very commonly um, put forward evolutionary argument for this and one that, that was developed in the literature and, and is, is still widely seen in, in the, the popular press as well, is this idea that, that we are getting fat because of what's become known as the thrifty gene hypothesis. And this is the notion, it, it's a rather comforting notion in a way. Um, it's the idea that we're actually, we're famine adapted, right? We're, we're always looking for opportunities to lay down some fat just in case, right? We're basically good metabolic boy scouts, you know, and girl scouts. That's, what, that's what's really occurring here. Um, and that's been really good throughout our history. Um, and thriftiness is brilliant. But, but of course, now we find ourselves in an environment where our dietary uh, environment, our dietary landscapes changed radically. Now we have access, huge availability, ready access to extremely calorie dense food. Um, you know, for for a pound from where I from where I work, I can't quite do it from where I live. But from from my office, I can walk for five minutes, and for one pound, I can purchase six thousand calories. I can buy um, a block of lard. Um, I don't recommend it. A bag of sugar, and uh, I, I can take in three days worth maybe of, of calories. But, you know, we 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 have an enormous opportunity for food. And and the way that the thrifty gene hypothesis is stated is that we've got these genes for thriftiness that allow us to lay down fat. But obviously, in this world of plenty, those um, those genes are acting against us and they're producing those sort of ballooning waistlines. And there'll be a variety, of course, a variation across the population in, in these in this genetic background. It won't be a single gene. There'll be a family of genes. And that produces the variation that we see. Now, that's quite a seductive idea. And it's an idea that um, that linked actually to um, one of the uh, side effects of it was originally put about because people were interested that this guy was interested in looking at um, diabetes, actually. Um, the problem with the thrifty gene hypothesis is that it's been very, very difficult to find any evidence for these thrifty genes. But there are some exceptions to that. And we have found some thrifty genes, but only in some quite interesting populations. And one of those populations are the Pacific Island nations. And the Pacific Island nations, if you if you graph uh, economic development, if you like, however you choose to map that, and that's very, very difficult. Um, I sort of tie myself up in knots in this section a little bit because it's actually very difficult to come out with a number that everyone agrees on. But there are some various indices that you can use to sort of measure, if you like, the 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 level of a modern lifestyle in terms of economics and so on. And if you map that uh, or graph that against um, the levels of obesity, you do find a very weak relationship between it. It's not quite as straightforward that a modern lifestyle is, is related that, that closely to obesity, but there is a weak relationship with an awful lot of noise. But there's something that's an absolute standout, and that is these, these Pacific Island nations, which are the most obese nations in the world, but also are not particularly high or far along the, the axis of, of, of economic development. And they stand out as a cluster in this graph. You can see it, a nice sort of um, group of points up, uh, up in the wrong place, if you like. And and it's in these groups um, that we've managed to find thrifty genes by doing all kinds of genetic analyses. And it's a very interesting history, actually. And, and those genes have also been found in, in other people, um, for example, um, Maori populations in New Zealand and across Micronesia. And what's rather interesting from an evolutionary perspective is that it makes sense. It's rather beautiful because these islands were populated by people that came. It's called the out of Taiwan hypothesis by people that came down through Indonesia from um, sort of the Taiwan area and, and islands there. And, and in order to make it as far out as they did across the South Pacific, um, there would have been quite a harsh selection event for people that were you know, too thin. Basically, these long sea voyages, unable to store much food is not a great environment um, if you can't pack away a little bit of reserves. Right. If you don't have a bit of timber on you and. Yeah, you know, those people that don't would have would have either would have very very likely not made it because these would have been very long and very arduous voyages over several generations over a long period of time. It's continual selection for individuals that are able to survive for a, a reasonably long time without um, access to sort of food. So the hypothesis there is that these genes that we can identify as being thrifty genes, and we can do all sorts of studies of those genes to show um, that that's what they are, make absolute sense within these island nations. And of course, the modern dietary environment is really conspiring against these island nations because what happened was the export um, or importation into those islands of, of very cheap, very fatty meat products, um, a product called mutton flaps and turkey tails. These are the two um, things that are really um, are being blamed for this. Mutton flaps are the sort of, um, uh, if you, um, when you butcher an animal and you, you remove its guts, you end up with these sort of flaps of, of kind of skin almost underneath the ribs. And it's often, they're quite fatty. There's very little meat content. Um, they're very cheap and um, there became a market for them here. And also turkey tails, which is literally the sort of parson's nose of a turkey. And these are very, very high in fat and calories. And 
they rapidly took off as a food source in, in these Pacific Island nations. And that environmental change for them against their background of, of genetic thriftiness has led to them leaving the world in terms of, of obesity. Uh, but actually, uh, oh, I'm very sorry, that picture is not rendered very well on the screen. There was someone in, a, in, a, in an animal skin looking like a sort of caveman and somebody else holding a load of fast food. Um, but, but that thrifty gene hypothesis actually doesn't hold much, much weight when you look across the world globally. And one of these sort of dominant competing hypotheses for that has become known as the drifty gene hypothesis. And this is the reason why I introduced genetic drift earlier. The drifty gene hypothesis is quite interesting. And that suggests that there are weight limits sort of that, that have been imposed by evolution a lower weight limit um, below which we basically starve to death so our body's sort of trying to put on fat um, to prevent that from happening but but also an upper weight limit because clearly back in our evolutionary history when we would have been more prey than than, than predator we have this very romantic notion of sort of man the hunter uh, but actually man the hunted is a far more far more sensible approach we, we would pray and, and still are in fact in many parts of the world and and the idea is that that about three million years or so ago there was a, a change in the um, megafauna of, of eastern africa there was a reduction in the number of predators saber-toothed cats for example died out quite abruptly and this slight relaxation in predation, and in some cases quite a hefty relaxation in predation, just meant that this upper weight limit that stopped people from getting too fat um, kind of drifted because it didn't matter too much if you were a little bit overweight suddenly. You weren't needing to run away from prey so much. At the same time, of course, we were evolving language. We were evolving more sociality, which would have helped greatly to protect us from predators. We were um, developing tool use throughout this time. And, and the notion is that, that as this predation um, removed, this lower weight limit pretty much stayed in place the biology of starvation has not changed but but the idea that the, that this upper limit was able to drift and it's drifted upwards in modern populations and we end up with this upper weight limit which can be highly variable between people and populations but it but it's above what you would find if you like if we were in a natural environment um, uh, where we have lots of predators and and that's that's the wrong way to look at it our evolutionary history over the last few thousand years is the natural environment um, you know we are part of that environment we have we have shaped that environment. Um, I, I do quite a lot of conservation work and, and, and biological work in, in southern Africa, for example, and, and people often talk about sort of, well, humans shouldn't be there. Well, we've been there for, for thousands and thousands of years. It's where we evolved. We are part of that landscape. Um, so it isn't necessarily unnatural um, that this has happened. It's part of what, what's occurred. But it's, it's thought that perhaps this thrifty limit has, um, or this thriftiness um, is, is not so important as this driftiness. Uh, but what's really interesting and certainly interesting to me writing that that book chapter is just how important obesity is and how significant it is to our health. And yet we still actually struggle to understand some of the very basic aspects of it. It's, it's really it's really an interesting thing. And, and something that came out throughout this book is that that we, we don't know as much about our species as perhaps we think we do. So. What really regardless of the evolutionary background to that, what 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 the in modern environment sort of change is, is this rapid increase in potency and concentration of the modern world and we see it we see it with food and we see it with lots of other things too um, i mentioned earlier the evolution of agriculture um, that was probably the biggest change of all about 12,000 years ago, the Neolithic Revolution, when we when we suddenly realized that, that it's much easier to plant food um, in the long run and to, to keep livestock than to sort of forage constantly. Um, that caused very large changes to us. But actually, initially, um, it caused big problems. Um, it, it introduced us to the world of tooth decay, for example. Um, our skulls became more gracile, our teeth became more overcrowded, we were taking in more uh, food that were richer in carbohydrates. We actually started to suffer from um, deficiencies during the early days of agriculture, which you can track back through the archaeological evidence. Um, we were growing fewer crops and fewer diversity of crops than we were able to forage. Um, the other problem, of course, that it caused is that it allowed us to live in much higher density settlements. And we start seeing this pattern through human history and it, it's really exacerbated and, and accentuated today by, by the development of these super cities, you know, tens of millions of people literally living on top of each other. And that all kind of started 12,000 years ago and, and we were evolving at that time. Um, lactose tolerance, or, or the, the flip side of it, lactose intolerance, shows us that evolution that, that occurred as a consequence of agriculture. Um, the ability to be able to, to process lactose, milk sugar, and to drink raw milk without it making you ill is actually only um, a, a trait that's shared by about a third of the world. 
uh, at the moment. This is the prevalence of lactose intolerance um, around the world. So the deeper the color, the less you can handle milk. And you can see that actually um, over, over there in China and Southeast Asia, uh, lactose intolerance is almost 100 percent. People can't drink raw milk over there. We can see the, the darker um, colors over here in uh, sort of former um, Soviet states here. I would attempt to name them all, uh, but you, you know the area I'm talking about. We can see down in Southern Africa and Eastern Africa, moving up into Central Africa, and even most of Sub-Saharan Africa, we see a reasonable amount of lactose intolerance. South America is characterized by about 60 to 80 percent lactose intolerance, becoming slightly um, more tolerant as we get up towards um, the USA, mostly because of the influx of Europeans who are largely um, lactose tolerance, um, and you can see, as, as is often the case, even with human studies on something that is of medical significance, we lack data in, in much of the world. So only about a third of, of adults can digest milk. And the reason for that is only a third of adults have the mutations that enable us to, to continue to do that through what's called lactase persistence. So lactase is the enzyme that allows us to break down lactose, and normally it turns off after we've well, after we've been an infant. We, we you know, mammals don't drink milk past infancy, but we can. We're we're a bit unusual for that, or at least a third of us are. And those enzymes that that enzyme persisting is a mutation, and we can follow that mutation through. And it's a mutation that came about. And this is, this is a pattern of those mutations that, that, that you can find across the world. And the reason why it came about was because we evolved. We evolved in response to the environment we were in. Um, we started keeping livestock. Livestock produce milk. Milk is a product. You'd have a go at tasting it. Individuals that groups and populations that kept dairy, those individuals that could drink milk as an adult or at least could drink cheese at least initially would have done well, particularly in times when um, stored products like cheese would have been very advantageous. It's a relatively clean and hygienic product and so on. Um, there are all sorts of advantages to be able to do this. And what we end up with is this really interesting hand-in-hand -in -hand evolution of cultural evolution, so the evolution of, of dairying. Um, the development of dairying, if you like, what Richard Dawkins would call, I guess, a meme, um, going hand in hand with the biological evolution of lactase persistence. And we can look at that pattern that we saw earlier of lactase persistence across the world, and we can map that against the amount of dairying. And, and areas that don't have lactase persistence and, and are lactose intolerant um, don't haven't had uh, an environment of dairying and of course um, don't then have this sort of runaway kind of co-selection going on um, and I, I put in there blessed of the cheesemakers it's, it's very likely that the evolution of cheese uh, or the, the evolution of the idea of making cheese um, was was a good sort of stepping stone into this um, what we're seeing now of course because um, of globalization and because of globalization of ideas we're getting a huge increase in dairy consumption across the world which is causing some um, concern for environmental issues um, but a lot of that dairy is being eaten in the form of cheese because many countries and many people are eating dairy despite being basically lactose intolerant, intolerant but dairy in the form of cheese is much easier for them to digest. The problem is that cheese is extremely yummy and we tend to add it to things. It's an ideal topping right for lots and lots of products and when you add lots of cheese to lots of things you build up your calcium which is wonderful for preventing osteoporosis um, but you also have a tendency towards uh, putting on the pounds and as we've seen um, obesity is a rising problem too so it's quite possible that this echo of evolution in terms of lactase persistence and impersistence is encouraging encouraging um, some nations to eat more cheese now, which is then going hand in hand with our drifting nature and producing obesity. So all of these things are, are interlinked. Um, let's look at a few other examples. Um, stress. Stress is a, a huge problem in the modern world. Chronic stress is a medical problem that's causing all sorts of issues uh, for people, not just mental health issues, but physical symptoms as well, um, aches and pains, headaches, and so on. Um, we live in a very stressful environment. And it seems slightly ridiculous when you think about what must have happened in our ancestry to think of the modern world, which is luxurious and safe for a great many of us most of the time as being stressful. Um, but, but stress is much more complex than that. Um, stress is actually, it's an evolved lifesaver. Um, the fight or flight response is at the heart of, of stress. It's the production of, of adrenaline, essentially, um, and the whole beautifully evolved and choreographic ballet of hormones that happens in our body when something immediate happens that requires us to do something. And uh, my life's been saved more than once by this response. I'm sure many people listening have. Um, if, and if you haven't um, had your life saved, you certainly saved yourself from serious injury as a consequence. And that will be the case 
all the way back through your ancestral line. We are here right now having this conversation because of the stress response. And, and in fact, it evolved a very long time ago and you can track it back through all sorts of different taxa. The issue is that the hormones that, that we produce as a consequence of the stress effect, it does this wonderful thing to our body. It, it amps us up, it, it gets our, our brains and our, our body and our blood pressure and everything. Everyone's ready, right? We're ready to kick off, we're ready to fight, or it is generally the best thing to do to flee. The issue is that if we start getting those stress, that stress response being triggered by micro stressors all the time, we get a very constant drip feed of these hormonal um, uh, things, which which all this this hormones, these hormones, which cause over time a chronic um, a chronic buildup of them and a chronic effects in, in, in our physiology and our and our overall well-being. And this is something we're really starting to come to terms with now and understanding how it affects us as we see this modern life of the last few decades um, coming through and people are getting older and, and, and we can start to see those effects. And, and stress really is a, a major problem. And, and again, it, it's conspiring with this potency of the modern world. The modern world has concentrated things in and suddenly we have an awful lot more availability for stress, just as we do for food. And that stress is much more potent and concentrated and it's constant. Um, we're quite, you know, most of us are constantly concerned in some ways, for example, about money. Um, people are concerned about their careers. Uh, we're concerned about our online networks. We're concerned about social media. We're concerned at the moment about much more existential problems, which which for many of us is the first time that, that we've been concerned about this in a, a globalized way. Um, we're concerned about small things, you know, as uh, will my kids go back to school in September? If they do, if they don't, how will I cope with that? You know, it's all constantly in there. At the same time, we, we've got sort of our everyday living stresses. We've got to, we still got to get food, right? We're still animals. We still need to eat and so on. And all of these things provide a constant drip feed. And it's that, it's that potency of the modern world that's conspiring against this fabulous evolved life life-saving mechanism that can produce in, in some people and, and in some people more than others, uh, almost a constant stress, a uh, constant state of, of, of micro stress all the time. And, and we're just coming to terms with, with the influences of that on our health and well-being. but we know that it's a problem. And when you log on to the NHS website and it comes, it's treating stress very seriously. And it's got a lot of things which seem more kind of Glastonbury than Harley street in terms of what it's suggesting. But actually most of the suggestions, when you look at them are effectively, they, they boil down to sort of pull yourself together, and go out for a walk or something like that. It's quite clear that we're not dealing with this very well. We need to find the, the lexicon and, and the language, you know, the, the ways to deal with this in this modern world. I, I mentioned it back then, but social media is, a, is another form of stress for many people in the modern world. And this is a really nice example of a mismatch with our evolutionary past. Um, one of the things that I realized as researching, researching this chapter in the book, it isn't very clear that, that social media is bad. But as soon as social media came on, within within a seemingly about six months of Facebook coming up, uh, a Netherlands group were publishing data and, and studies to show that, that Facebook interactions were causing problems for, for younger people. Um, and since then, there's been a huge amount of research that looks at it. But actually, our relationship with social media is complex, and it's, it's changing all the time as our social media landscape and environment changes all the time. What is very clear is that some people, um, particularly people that tend to be um, more warrior than warrior, um, people that tend to have a more ruminative nature, um, very very clearly can have a very bad relationship with it and all of us I think can have a difficult relationship with it at times including me um, I, I've now got Twitter uh, six sweeps away on my home screen and I never keep it loaded up so that I have to go on to it in order to engage with it rather than have these constant notifications because um, it interacts with my reward center my evolve reward center in my brain and um, yeah I find myself addicted to um, stronger word but I find myself constantly on there because of the reward of, of, of affirmation of likes and so on you know it, it conspires against us but in the case of social media and networks there's a really interesting evolutionary echo which is still being explored but it comes down to this idea of Dunbar's number which is it's quite an, uh, a well-established concept now in, in social sciences and Dunbar's number is, is was um, come up with by the um, anthropologist and primatologist Robin Dunbar and he came up with this idea that it's about, it's about 150, 135, 250. And it's the typical number of people that we can keep track of and consider part of our ongoing social network. So he describes it rather nicely as the, the, the sort of the number of people that you could go up to in a bar, sit down and have a drink with and not feel embarrassed about it. And, and as we've come up with, with more and more refinements to that, we, we can look at how we can uh, almost onion skin uh, Dunbar's number out between these sorts of numbers, 5, 15, 50, and 150. And if we look across 
the archaeological evidence and the evidence of different types of societies around the world now, and if we look at our own interactions and so on, we can see Dunbar's number resonating. And the idea really is that this is an evolved characteristic of our brain because we're a social species. Uh, it's an evolved characteristic. And in fact, when Dunbar's number is being um, treated as controversial, what people are really saying is that the number is wrong, not that the concept's wrong. So you can find lots of other numbers um, and some of them are as, as high actually as 1,200 in some studies. Some of them are as uh, are more like sort of 300. But but no one's denying that there's an upper limit. And at some point, that upper limit is the number of faces we can recognise. It's actually imposed by the the mental structures of our you know, evolved structures of our memory. And what we see with this is that there are there is a theoretical maximum number of of, of networks. And and very very comfortably, most people, even with modest social networks, exceed Dunbar's number with their social network alone, let alone their real life network. And what we're really unsure about at the moment is how our virtual networks, which in some cases can reach tens or even hundreds of thousands of people, how they interact with our real world network and how that interacts with our, our brain and our evolved mental processes for keeping track of, of friends, family, clan and tribe. But what is very clear is that in many people, um, these relationships can be problematic and we're still burying down into that. But I think it's fair to say that that, that at the root of it will be a, a deep rooted evolutionary mismatch between us as social beings living in a real world and us now as, as social beings living in a virtual world. And I guess one of the problems is we change the virtual world so quickly that by the time we get a handle on this virtual world, we've got a new virtual world to deal with. So it's going to be very interesting to see how that changes over time. Um, so there's um, so sort of yeah, out in the outer reaches of Dunbar's number there. It's, it's still uh, a, a number of people that's comfortably exceeded by many people's um, social networks. Um, so just to finish a few more examples um, of where we are, um, the victims, if you like, of, of, of well-meaning evolutionary solutions. Um, I mentioned earlier addiction. Uh, in many cases, our uh, attraction towards and addiction to drugs are down to um, this hijack hypothesis. We have this fabulous reward pathway, this dopamine pathway in our brain, um, which fundamentally evolved to make us have sex and eat. These are good things. And if we keep doing them, we survive and have more offspring. So our brain has this wonderful evolved mechanism whereby things that that um, that, that cause us to, to eat and have sex are rewarded and we do more of it. Um, but we can also train that reward pathway for, for other things as well. Um, and what happens with, with many modern substances um, or many drugs also um, archaeologically is that they are able to interact with that reward center in much more potent ways and there's that word again the potency of our environment is far greater um, not only not only from um, uh, invented drugs if you like so drugs that we've made chemically uh, but also from drugs that we've refined from the natural world so cocaine is an example on the screen here um, we've been chewing coca leaves for in, in South America for I'm guessing as long as we've had people in Southern America. Um, but to chew enough coca leaves to get the same um, equivalent amount of cocaine as a, as a hit of cocaine, you would have to be um, stuffing handfuls of coca leaves in your mouth and processing them in seconds. What we've done in a modern world is focused and made more potent natural substances and then through our amazing brains we've come up with this fabulous globalized system where we're able to distribute it around the world um, and that has created this potent environment where we our brains are hijacked and we're willing hijackees um, we can see it with alcohol. There's a fabulous um, hypothesis Robert Dudley, the drunken monkey, um, which talks very nicely about evolutionary changes to our enzymes which we can track back through our um, phylogenetic past so we can look at how these enzymes are shared through our recent ancestors and so on. And it would appear that our attraction towards alcohol may be linked to the fact that ethanol being produced in fermenting fruits would have made it easier for us to find. So there is a very deep rooted evolutionary relationship with alcohol, which is probably the most abused drug um, in the modern world. Um, but you know, there, there's this same reward center um, hijacking going on with these other substances too. And we can see it as well with um, other problematic behaviors like gambling and um, well, we can talk about gambling later, but, but gambling has an evolutionary hangover as well. And it's to do with the idea of being risk averse versus being um, uh, open to risk. And if you're open to risk, you're more likely to find mates and food. But if you're risk averse, you're more likely to stay safe and live longer. And we have to trade those things off and balance them. We are all gambling all the time. We just don't realize it. Our brains are pre are sort of wired up for these types of decisions. And when we start rewarding them with uh, with an uncertain reward schedule and bright lights and, and so on, we overstimulate 
stimulate our, our reward mechanisms and, and all of those evolutionary echoes conspire against us and we can end up with, with problem gambling behavior. Um, I'll finish up, um, I'm just aware of the time, I'll finish up quite quickly. Um, violence is another um, topic that I go into in the book, not an easy one and, and not something that, that um, you know, is perhaps a subject for a, a, an entire session at some point. But we can come up with plausible evolutionary scenarios as to why violence would be an advantage. And clearly at times violence is an advantage. It would be ridiculous to suggest otherwise. Um, but it would be equally ridiculous to suggest that we are uniquely um, Violent. We're not. We uh, plenty of evidence of other mammals killing their own species, despite what you might read. It's kind of an endearingly naive idea that, that we're the only ones that do it. Um, a very interesting, wide-ranging survey of, of mammals published very recently showed that in 40% of, of mammal um, groups, we can find conspecific lethal behavior. In other words, members of the species killing each other. Um, but what's interesting when you look around, there's lots of areas where we lack data, but probably if we looked, we'd find it. <laughs> there's a, a definite correlation between studying animals and finding they kill each other. Uh, but we move around this wheel and we get up into the primates and we can see that the primates are unusually violent. We come from an unusually violent taxa. We come from an unusually violent group within those taxa and within that group we are about seven times more violent than than, um, than other members. So we, 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 do, we are unusually violent but we're not unique in having that conspecific violence. Um, whether we're becoming more or less violent is, is very interesting. Uh, you can find very, very convincing theses that we are uh, that we're not and that we haven't changed and, and I think we're still getting to grips with that um, but we can certainly look at um, the evolution of violence we've uh, there are a number of studies which have shown a genetic basis a genetic tendency towards violence in, in family groups and so on um, but equally just as we might have evolved from this background of violence um, we've also evolved mechanisms to limit violence uh, mental structures and, and so on that, that allow us to not lash out all the time because that would also be disadvantageous in um, societies as we become groups and right now as we become much larger groups that's even more disadvantageous. Um, I've, I've put in a, a little bit at the end there, have we evolved for violence? There's a rather interesting uh, scientist called um, uh, Robert Carrier who looks at the idea that, that things like the human fist may have actually evolved its its form and its shape in, all, in order to hit other people and he did quite a load of macabre experiments involving um, amputated arms from um, medical uh, cadavers to um, to investigate that um, but I can I can go into that later. Um, so to just finish up then, um, what, what about the future? Well, this was the most surprising thing that I came across when I was researching this book. Um, one of the biggest problems is that we have evolved mental heuristics that, um, that, that deal with the here and now. Evolution is a here and now thing, right? An immediate um, process. We are immediate animals, right? Here and now. Animals worry about what's in front of them, not what's going to happen in five generations time. Our brains are hardwired to think that way. And, and psychologists have done a whole series of very interesting experiments to show that we don't view future us in the same way that we view present us. Um, if we are asked to visualize what's happening to present us, we see it with point of view. If we ask asked to visualize what's happening to future us, we see future us in the third person. For example, we we physically see future us as a different person. But you can look at it in a more sophisticated way too and do all sorts of experiments where you can ask people to uh, make decisions on particularly unpleasant things, for example, or, or having to do more work or volunteer for something. Um, what would you allocate to you now and what would you allocate to future you? And, and what, we, what we can show is that we devalue future us and we devalue the future in terms of, of, of these things. Um, and against the present. Um, but what I found really interesting, and I think what gives us hope and was actually sort of my overall lesson from this book, is that with a very, very simple interaction, a very simple intervention rather, we can be made to think better about us in the future. If we simply say to people, before we ask them, how much do you want to, how much money should you allocate to yourself now in the future? How much horrible drink should you drink now or in the future? If before you do that, you say to people, listen, in the future, future you is you. Future you is going to have the same hopes and dreams and emotions and the same aspirations and ambitions as you do right now. If you stick that in front of the question, you can actually get people to view future them and other people in exactly the same way as they view future uh, present day them. And I think that's a really interesting thing. Our evolutionary heritage, yes, has built us this kind of amazing heuristic that allows us to keep going in the here and now. But with a very small amount of research and a little bit of prodding, we can be made to think in, in different ways. And I think that's the thing. We, we shouldn't feel tied by our evolutionary past, but understanding our evolutionary past gives us the ability to be able to change the future. And, and right now, that's clearly what, what we need. Um, thank you very much for listening. I am at, at the end. Uh, so I'm, I'm ready for questions.
Excellent. Thank you, Adam. That was a wonderful talk. We all really enjoyed it. Okay, now we're, uh, because we're coming near the end, we've just got time for a couple of questions for you. Um, and you've got quite a few questions here. So I've um, heard from the team that what we can also do is you might be able to answer the questions, the remaining questions post event, and we could send the answers out if you're prepared to do um, that. Yes, that's fine. If we can keep a record of them and you can um, ping them to me. Absolutely. Uh, that would be great. So if I can pass a couple of questions to you then, uh, we've had questions on several different themes. Um, and one of the things I think is really interesting, Richard had asked us about how our behaviour, um, so he's talking about driving. Um, we sit behind a dashboard and a steering wheel for long periods, so we drive here and there, very unsuited to that. Um, so how does that actually influence our genes and our DNA? Um, is this something, are we going to evolve to be better suited yeah. for these kind of things? He's, he's asked us. Um, it, it would be it would be nice to to sort of think that that we might do, or equally a bit bit scary that we'll sort of evolve into these slumped creatures. The, the biggest problem is that the evolution can only happen if there's a genetic tendency towards whatever trait we're talking about, but also if that that trait is is manifesting itself or that that environment is is influencing our reproduction and behavior now if driving around or, or slumping and, and sort of slouching in seats is causing us to become so physically um decrepit that we're unable to mate i mean let's view ourselves as animals for a while that we're unable to mate or have offspring then clearly those individuals that are 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 not coping with that environment very well and are particularly prone to, for example, back problems to such an extent that they can't breed, um, that, that could result, I guess, in a selection event. The reality, of course, is that that's not the case for most uh, most of the traits that we're talking about. Um, that, that it simply doesn't manifest itself that way, either because of our behavior um, and the way that the way that we, we couple up and have to have children isn't necessarily always based on those features, but also, of course, we can have medical interventions and so on that, that, that help us out. Um, which I suppose you could argue ultimately aren't helping us. We should we should be looking at we shouldn't be treating those symptoms. We should be looking at the ways that we do it. And I think that that's an important insight that you can get from looking at this from an evolutionary perspective. Is that evolution has created us as a very handy physical unit, and we are not using ourselves in that way. We are we are using ourselves in a very different way, and our bodies aren't coping very well with it. And we we need to find ways. We need to find interventions, often quite simple invent, interventions to do that. Um, standing desks are incredibly popular now and seem to be um, very effective for some people. Um, I'm not sure we're going to have standing cars. Um, that feels like a, a difficult thing. Um, but yeah, if you spend a lot of time in a car, your your, your evolutionary echoes are, are not helping. Um, we, we were not designed to sit down. We were designed. To, we're a locomotory creature. We are an endurance hunter, an endurance creature, and, and and it's not it's not particularly healthy for us to be doing that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just gonna we'll just tidy up with one more question because I know there's been lots of interest and lots of excitement. So um, this might be a little bit of a large one, but Sylvia asked, what about epigenetics? Um, epigenetics, yes. Yeah. So this is the idea that that um, uh, changes are happening during our, our our lifetime and changes to our genetic code. It's um it's a huge subject. Um, and not something I know a huge amount about in terms of in terms of humans. However, what I do know is that whenever whenever we look for these effects and, and whenever we're looking for it across species, we're, we're finding them to be more and more um, important. So it's it's not something I know a huge about 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 in terms of, of humans, but I'm quite sure that it's enormously important. I'm quite sure actually there are participants and attendees here that know a great deal more about this than I do. Um, but yes, I'm sure it will prove to be a very important um, feature and, and, and part of, of human genetic study. And, and already is actually. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for that. There was lots of really, really interesting things. You've given us lots of things to think about as we go about our, you know, day to day activities. We'll be thinking about things in a different way, I'm sure, from now on. So, thank you very much for that. Thank talk. you. Um, to remind everybody, um, as we're closing, the recording of this event will be available on the festival YouTube channel, which can be accessed from the watch again section of the festival website. However, please allow a couple of days for it to appear. If you'd like to purchase a copy of Adam Hart's book, which is highly recommended, Unfit for Purpose, will be available from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. For more information on book sales, please see the festival website or head direct to Fox Lane Books slash Festival of Ideas. We very much hope that you'll continue to be engaged with York Festival of Ideas. Check out the website 
yorkfestivalofideas.com for full details of all the events in the festival program. We'd love to hear your thoughts on these events and continue the conversations using the hashtag, hashtag York Ideas. So I, we would have loved to have given you a big round of applause uh, there, Adam. I know we've got like nearly 200 people here listening to you. So um, I'm sorry that we can't. I'll do a very small one here for me, but I'm sure I try and count for everybody else who would have liked Thank to have you. given you a round of applause. Thank you.